Good morning and welcome to Oakdale Baptist Church. We're so glad that you are here with us this morning and we look forward to a great day of worship. We hope that uh, you've had a great week and that this is really just kind of the icing on the cake for you this week. I do have a couple of announcements that I want to mention to you that are very important of uh, some upcoming things. One of those is our very own Mackenzie Ford and her fiance Dustin Boatwright are uh, having a wedding shower up here uh, at the church on May the 30th at 10 a.m. It'll be a kind of a come and go thing and we would encourage you to come and be a part of that. It'll be a great time and I know that you want to celebrate what God is doing with them. Also want to tell you that on May the 31st, we are going to come back together for a church on the lawn. Of course, weather permitting, but we're going to be meeting uh, on the big patio, and, uh, and we encourage you to come and bring your own lawn chairs. We won't have chairs for you, so you need to bring your chairs and uh, set those out in the lawn and kind of separate from one another a little bit. But that'll give you an opportunity to kind of come back together, see one another, and worship together. So that will be next Sunday, May 31st at 11 o'clock. Uh, so we encourage you to be here and be a part of that. If weather is uh, a bad and keeping us from doing that, then we will live stream the service. And uh, so you'll be able to stay at home and, and continue to watch it and worship with us. Again, we're glad that you are here with us this morning. And I look forward to a great day of worship together. Why don't we uh, pray together, and then we will move into our time of worship as Jamie leads us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day that you have blessed us with another Sunday to come and worship you. Though we may be doing it apart, Father, we are together with you. And so we praise you and thank you for what you are doing and for how you are doing it. God, I ask that you would bless this time together this morning. May everything that is done and said be done and said to bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the violence the poor since they are many his mercy is more Here's my 
You are full of where I'm broken. You are whole. What I'm doubting, you are sure of. So I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. Their human bones are as fragile as mine. I have my flaws, but they have the same kind. And I was afraid, cause I could not see. Grace says that they're in the same boat as me. And what I Of the arrows by day, nor the darkness that comes when the sun rolls away. And Lord, you know that my strength never lasts, but you make up for every weakness I have. And what I What I confess, you will cover. What I let go, you control. Lord, my hope is in no other. I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. Sing it again. What I lack, you are full of. You are full of where I'm broken. You are whole. Yes, you are. What I'm doubting, you are sure of. So I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. Sing that again. I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. Peace be still, calm this soul. I need you here and now. Restore my hope. And I confess I've been afraid. Remind my heart, Lord, increase my faith. So I will run to the waves as courage comes to take first place with perfect love. Perfect love. Oh, what can take away? my hallelujah no darkness can contain my hallelujah your cross has made the way for my hallelujah my hallelujah you give 
no man can take, no power in hell can separate. And who can stand against your might with armies of angels by my side? place with perfect love your perfect love oh what can take away my hallelujah no darkness can contain my hallelujah your cross has made the way for my Shadows will fade, darkness will break. I'll keep on singing your praise. Nothing can take my hallelujah. Nothing can take my hallelujah. Shadows will fade, darkness will break. I'll keep on singing your praise. Nothing can take. can contain my hallelujah your cross has made the way for my hallelujah my hallelujah will you follow me wherever I lead, will you trust me as we go? When the pain is deep and you're feeling weak, I am sovereign over all. I am with you, right beside you. I know what you need. In this world you will have trouble, but I will never leave. Will you follow me wherever I lead? Will you trust me as we go? When the pain is deep and you're feeling weak, I am sovereign over Follow me wherever I lead. Will 
you trust me as we go? trust you. Good morning. I'm Justin Ford, pastor here at Oakdale Baptist Church. I'm so glad to have you with us this morning. Let me invite you to do a couple of things. First of all, if you have your Bible with you and you want to follow along with us, we're going to be in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. That is in the Old Testament. And then we will have all the scripture on the screen behind me as well. Uh, We also would invite you to utilize our message notes, which you can find uh, in our daily email or on Facebook, and uh, feel free to print those out and use them just like you would on any Sunday morning. We are in week four of our spring series called Don't Worry, where we've been learning about the difference between worrying versus trusting our Heavenly Father for tomorrow. I think the main principle we've learned is that we worry about the things that we care the most about. And that if we change those things, we can decrease the amount of worry that we experience in our lives. And I think most of us would kind of nod our heads in agreement about that. But as we continue our series today, here is the temptation that many of us face. While we may agree that we don't want to worry, Underneath, if we're really honest with ourselves, many of us feel that we need to worry, that we're supposed to worry, because somehow that's the responsible thing for us to do. And so today, I'm going to continue our series by telling you a story from the Old Testament. And this is a very interesting story that has some very interesting things to say to us specifically about worry. In 1 Kings 19, we're introduced to a guy named Elijah who had a lot to worry about. And towards the end of his story, God asks Elijah just a phenomenal question. In fact, if you are a worrier or if you find yourself more worried at this particular time in your life or or in our culture, this is going to be a question for you, okay? And, And we'll get to that question in a minute, but first let me give you just a little bit of background on 1 Kings 19 and what's taking place. This particular story happens around 850 BC, during a time when a wicked man named Ahab was the king of Israel. And one of the reasons that Ahab was so bad was that Ahab had led Israel away from following Jehovah God and into things like worshiping the pagan god Baal. And so God did for Ahab what he's done for all of us at one time or another. He sent into Ahab's life the voice of truth in the form of Elijah the prophet. And so Elijah went to Ahab and said, listen, God is sick and tired of the way that you're leading his people. And so he's going to get your attention by not letting it rain anymore. Now, you need to recognize that rain was tied directly to the people's livelihood, okay? So, in essence, God was going to wreck the nation's economy in order to get the attention of its leaders. Ever wonder if God still does that kind of stuff today? 
Well, Ahab, as was his habit, he did not want to listen to Elijah. Didn't think Elijah or anybody else controlled the rain. But sure enough, for three years, it didn't rain. Now, we've been dealing with the coronavirus for like three months. Imagine dealing with it for three solid years. Well, at the end of the three years, God allows it to rain again. And then he sets up a showdown between King Ahab and Elijah at a place called Mount Carmel, which sounds like a delicious dessert, but is actually just a barren mountain. And if you remember the story at all, Elijah just absolutely humiliates King Ahab. He kills the 400 prophets of Baal and proves once and for all that Jehovah God is absolutely the God of Israel. Meanwhile, Ahab slinks back home to his wife Jezebel, who is like literally the wicked witch of the north. And this is where our story today begins in 1 Kings 19, beginning with verse 1. Here's what it says. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. And so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods, that's a little g gods, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. In other words, Jezebel says, by this time tomorrow, Elijah, your life is over. Now, from our perspective, at this point in the story, we kind of expect Elijah to say something like, well, bring it on, Jezebel, right? Because from our perspective, what could Elijah possibly have to worry about? Nothing, right? Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Now, wait a minute, Elijah. Do you not remember what just happened to you? Do you not realize that God just proved himself to you in one of the most incredible displays of proof ever? How could you be afraid? How could you be worried? I can tell you exactly how. Because Elijah was a human, just like you and just like me. Elijah wasn't some comic book superhero. He was real. And he experienced the same real fears and the same real worries that you and I experience every day of our life. If you think about it, what happened was that Elijah did okay with the now for about three years. But it was the tomorrow that he couldn't deal with. When the rain was on hold and God was providing and the prophets were being dealt with, Elijah was just great. But when Jezebel says, come tomorrow, your life is over, Elijah says, oh no, I I can't control tomorrow. And so he ran for his life. Now, here's what I would expect from many of us. If I were to drop into your life and look at all of God's past faithfulness to you, and then look at the thing that you're worried about right now and compare those two things together, I suspect I would be tempted to say to you, what are you worried about? And you'd say, but tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And I'd say, but do you not remember two days ago, two weeks ago? Do you not remember 2016? Yeah, 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 but, but tomorrow, tomorrow, right? And by the way, the same thing would be true for me as well. Well, here's Elijah totally blanking out on God's past faithfulness because he's consumed with this threat about tomorrow. And so he takes off for the hills. Verse 3, he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. That's right. 
he prayed that he would die. And remember, this is the same guy who just a couple of weeks before this was a rock star. He was the man. And now he says, verse 4, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Basically, Elijah says, tomorrow is so uncertain for me, I'm better off dead. Verse 5, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him. I hate when that happens. I don't know about you. The angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some breaked Uh, bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Now think about this. Elijah runs away from where he's supposed to be and sits down under a broom bush to die. But an angel of the Lord appears and provides both a meal and some encouragement. In my way of thinking, this was God's way of showing Elijah that it was time to get up, go back, and deal with the situation, right? So, verse 8, And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of of God. Now, can you remember anything significant that happened at Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is where Moses experienced God in the burning bush. Mount Sinai is where the Israelites went after they left Egypt. Moses went up on the mountain and received from God the law, the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai is where in the the minds of the Jewish people God hung out because they had experienced him there at important times throughout their history. And so Elijah, who had been given the strength and the encouragement he needed to go back and face Jezebel, instead spends over a month, 40 days and 40 nights, traveling to this lonely, deserted, uninhabited place so that he could die as close to God's presence as he could possibly get. All because tomorrow was so uncertain. Verse 9. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, And then listen to this question. It is so important. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, Elijah, you are miles and miles away from where I had you. You have been doing my work and living under my protection for years. And now all of a sudden, you are miles and miles from where you're supposed to be because suddenly tomorrow seems so uncertain. Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, I love this question, and we'll finish the story in just a minute. But I love this question because I have a feeling that some of us who are so stressed out about the uncertainty of tomorrow, that we've done some running ourselves, haven't we? Some of us have run mentally. We're so detached from our families. Some of us have run away physically. You've run away from your family. You've run away from your parents. Some of us have run away emotionally because of problems and fears and relationships. Some of us are in places we've never been before, and it's all because of the stress and the anxiety and the fear of tomorrow. And as scary as all of that might be, the reality is you are in a place you have no business being. What if God showed up in that place that you had no business being? whether physically, emotionally, spiritually, and said to you, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing here? 
what are you doing here? Why did you run? Why did you allow the uncertainty of tomorrow, and oh, by the way, tomorrow is always uncertain. Why have you allowed the threat of tomorrow, oh, by the way, tomorrow is always somewhat threatening. Why have you allowed a future you can't control, oh, by the way, it's a future you've never been able to control. Why have you trusted in the threat of an employer, the threat of your health, the threat of the economy, the threat of your finances, the threat of your children or husband or wife or parents? Why have you allowed the uncertainty of tomorrow to drive you to a place you have no business being? What are you doing here? That was God's question to Elijah. So, how does he respond? Well, he did what we all want to do. He started telling God his story. He started justifying his actions and his attitudes. Listen to this in verse 10. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. In other words, he's saying, God, what do you mean what am I doing here? What, do you expect me to stay in Jerusalem? You expect me to stay in the vicinity of Ahab and Jezebel? You expect me to stay there under the threat of death? I mean, I don't know if you've been paying attention, God, but do you even know what's going on around me? Listen to God's response. Verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, you ready for this? What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. In other words, Elijah, if there was no me, then I could understand, but there's me. Did you like the firework display on Mount Carmel? Did you like the mountain removal and rearrangement that you just experienced here? How about that earthquake? How about the fire? I'm trying to get your attention. There's me. You're looking through the lens of circumstance, but you're forgetting that there is no purpose and there is no hope apart from me. So Elijah, what in the world are you doing in this place? Verse 14, he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. In other words, he gives the same rehearsed story all over again. It's kind of pathetic, isn't it? Sounds just like something you or I would do. Verse 15, then the Lord told him, and this is important, go back the way you came. What? Yeah, you got to go back. You have to start all over. You see, you were in my will. Then you got out of my will by coming to this place where you never should have been. And so as a physical reminder, I'm sending you back to where you came from. Go back, verse 15, the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be the king of Aram. Now, I realize that for us, that is almost meaningless. But let me tell you why that is actually very significant. 
Aram already had a king. But God says, I want you to go to this country and find this particular guy and anoint him king. The same king, by the way, who will eventually lead an army that will eventually kill King Ahab. Verse 16. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. Okay, time out. Israel already has a king too. His name is Ahab. His wife is Jezebel. They're trying to kill me. God says, I know that. We're going to replace the king and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Ebel Mahola to replace you as my prophet. Okay, wait, wait, wait. You have a prophet, me. I know. We're getting ready to have a new one. Verse 17, anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Oh, okay, so you've like thought this through. You like have a plan. All that stuff, I've been telling you about how bad things are. You already knew all of that? So there is a future, there is a purpose, you're up to something? I didn't know that. God says, exactly. And that is why I'm asking you, what are you doing here? Now, here's the application for us. If you've allowed your worries to drive you into behaviors habits, decisions, and actions that you've never had before. I think this is God's question for you today. What are you doing here? I mean, if there is no God, I understand why you would go there. But you, your whole life, have believed that there was a God. And many of you, for most of your life, have believed that Jesus is a significant part of that. And many of us believe that he's the savior of the world, God's son sent to die for our sins. And many of us have enough history with God that we've seen God's faithfulness over and over and over again, not always the way we thought it should be, but in an amazing way, we've even seen the bad things happen that we're glad happened because God turned them somehow into good things. And we've told the stories, and we've written the emails, and we've shared the testimonies. So the truth is that most of us have enough history with God that there's really no excuse for us to be where we've allowed worry to cause us to be. And, by the way, God is still in control. And God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. And you need to take the advice God gave to Elijah and get back to where you were so that you can face tomorrow with the confidence that God is there for you. Isn't it amazing how today's worries make us erase God's past faithfulness. Isn't that amazing? Today's worries have a tendency to just totally blank out all that God has done for us in the past. In fact, whenever I talk to someone who shares a story of God's faithfulness in their lives, I always try to encourage them to write those stories down, to share them with close friends and with family. Save these stories because God has been faithful to you in a tangible way. And one day you're going to need to read this story or be reminded of this story. Because in a moment of worry, it is just so easy for us to go places we have no business going. And it is so easy for us to forget God's past faithfulness. But not only does worry cause us to forget God's past faithfulness, today's worries make us doubt whether or not God will be there for us tomorrow. And you know, that really is the point of this entire series. And And it's the point of of what Jesus has taught us 
It's the point of what Elijah had to learn the hard way, that we are simply to do what we know to do today. We're to trust God for tomorrow. We're to do all that we can do today and then say, God, you've been faithful to me in the past. I'm trusting you to be faithful tomorrow. I'm not going to allow my stress and my anxiety and my worry to drive me places I have no business being. I'm going to walk into tomorrow confident that my God is with me. Now, your other option, of course, is to worry. Just go ahead and worry. Your other option is just to go ahead and spend lots of time and energy on things that you cannot control. You think that's a good strategy? Now, let me ask you one last question to consider. Have you gone some places you shouldn't go because of the stress and the chaos and the uncertainty of tomorrow, do you find yourself now physically, emotionally, or spiritually in a place or on your way to a place that you should not be? If so, listen to me. You've got to go back. You've got to go back to where you came from. Some of you may need to sit down with your whole family and just say, you know what? I have allowed my fear of tomorrow to cause me to become somebody I've never been in the past. Maybe you've developed a habit through this time of stress and worry, this time of physical and and health uncertainty, and through this time of financial uncertainty. You've got to break that habit. You've got to get help. Whatever it is, that worry and stress, wherever it's driven you, that you know you have no business being, I believe God's invitation for you today is to come back. So, my prayer for you and my prayer for me is that during these times of incredible uncertainty, that we as Christians and we as a church will respond in a way that is so different than the people around us. That our light would shine so bright, not because our circumstances are better, but because we refuse to allow the stress of the circumstances to drive us to places we have no business being. We're going to do all we can today, and we're going to trust God for tomorrow. And if God is as concerned about you as you are, remember the birds, remember the flowers, then there's no reason for us to fear tomorrow. I want us to join me in prayer. Let's ask God to help us find ways to be obedient to him. Heavenly Father, by this point, I think we all recognize and would probably admit that Worry just comes so naturally to us and especially worry about tomorrow, worry about the things that we just do not have any control over. But God, this story from the life of Elijah is a reminder to us that you are here, that you are in control, that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, that you have been faithful to us in the past. And we can trust you for tomorrow. We can't control it, but God, we know that you can. And so will you help us to to not allow our circumstances to erase your past faithfulness from our memory? And God, will you not allow, help us to not allow our present circumstances to cause us to go places we shouldn't be? Instead, God, we want to learn to trust in you, to depend on you, and to know that you will provide in your time, in your way, just like you always have. And God, we can trust in you for that. Now, God, will you help us be obedient to you? Help us be as faithful to you 
as you are to us. And may the world around us who is watching us, may they see something different in us during this time of great uncertainty. And somehow could you use this terrible thing to draw people closer to you. God, we know that that is the great privilege that we live with as believers in Christ. And I pray that we might be pleasing to you with our obedience. God, we love you. We trust you. Help us trust you for tomorrow, no matter what. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't have to worry For my God takes care of me I don't have to worry He gives everything I need He makes the flowers bright he feeds the birds until they're full I know how much my father loves me So I don't have to be afraid to worry for my God takes care of me I don't have to worry He gives everything I need He makes the conclude our time together today I would like us to join in a time of prayer and uh, thank God for what he has shown us in his word this morning won't you join with me as we pray together father we do thank you for your word the truth of your word we thank you that you have um, not called us to worry but yet you've called us to be faithful you've called us to trust you and so, Father, I pray that as we, um, as we are walking through these days that seem to not have real good answers right now, we just pray that no matter what the circumstance, no matter the situation, Father, that we will remain faithful to you. God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship together even though we're apart. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.